Everybody, hello, everybody, and welcome to SDP Connect. My name is Christiana Morales. I'm the director of self-determination program here. I'm tripping over my own mouth this today. <laughs> it's been one of those crazy weeks. I hope everybody is doing really well. Um, we have some great presenters. Everybody loves uh, these connects when we bring providers for you to meet um, and we have some great ones. But first we do have a few announcements. So I want to go through a couple announcements. So we're gonna start with our self advocates speaker training and our own Michaela is going to talk about that. Hello, thank you, Christiana. Hi, everybody. Um, I am just really briefly going to remind everyone, we've talked about it a few times before SDP Connect, but the self-advocate speakers training application is open for two more days. It closes on Friday night. You can hear my dog participating in this conversation. Um, the self-advocate speakers training is specifically for self-advocates, individuals with disabilities who are residing in California and over the age of 18. Um, it's a presentation training, so we focus on building elevator pitches, but throughout we talk about things like how to identify your audience, how to tell your story in an impactful way, um, and just generally how to get out there and start being a self-advocate. Um, so Eric is going to put our website and the link to the application in the chat right now. Um, and again, it's open till Friday. So if you're a self-advocate who wants to learn a little bit more about telling your own story, then come join us. Um, and our next announcement is from our own Gilda Hiron. Thank you, Christiana. Hello, everyone. Um, I've also announced this at S Everall Self-Determination, SCP Connects, but Disability Voices United is having, um, we have our upcoming equity conference coming up on November 8th, which is a little over two weeks. And I really, really would like this community at SCP Connect um, to be there. We are in need of more advocates, more self-advocates, more family members to be present. We have a lot of professionals that have signed up, so um, which is great. We have uh, the representation of different um, regional centers, uh, executive directors, um, service providers, but we really, really would love for the community self-advocates and um, family members to be present to make sure that your voices are included in this conversation. The most important, um, sorry, my phone started reading. Um, the most important is your voice. So we really, really would love for all of you to be there. And um, it's gonna be a one day conference and the day is going to start with a keynote speech um, and who's also a parent and um, is Dr. S uh, Sergio Aguilar, um, and then we're going to have a panel of uh, people with disabilities and family members who will talk about their experiences uh, with disparities, um, followed by a panel of experts sharing what we still need to learn and the data that is out there. Um, but the heart of the conference is our breakout sessions, um, where you'll be a part of really important conversations that we're having um, around we have different breakout sessions that you can select from. You can select two, or you can move around if you like. But um, education, um, healthcare, and if I don't know if, if somebody could put it in the chat or if they already have, but we have an agenda on our website that shows all the breakout sessions. And um, this conference is gonna be focusing not just on regional centers, but on healthcare and the education system. So those are the three main parts of our equity conference. And it's not just about racial um, inequities, it's about um, geographic disparities or, um, and, um, and so, and other parts of, um, of equity that intersect. So I really would hope that our SCP Connect folks can join us, um, it really, really, would make a difference to have all of your voices there present um, and heard. So thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Thanks, Gilda. Um, so if you want to see our happy little faces, we are going to be at the Autism Acceptance Walk in Cathedral City this Saturday from 10 to 1. Um, and we will put the link in the chat if you're going to be in that area. We would love to see you. 
It's a spooktacular, so we're all going to be dressed up. There's going to be trick or treating. Um, our team is very excited about this in a because we're all dressing up. And most important, Tina, do you want to tell them how you're dressing up? Because I'm so excited about this. I'm dressing up as the scarecrow, and my service dog is dressing up as the lion from The Wizard of Oz. Which best costume ever? I'm so excited about that. So if you want to come see us in person, we would love to see you there. Um, just two more um, reminders. Uh, we do have Disability Voices United has an independent facilitator roundtable meeting. This is not open to everybody. This is specifically for independent facilitators. It's coming up this Thursday and it's from one to two. So you do want to register in advance and come. So if you are one, please feel free to join us. We talk about all things related to being an independent facilitator. In addition, I want to say that we often have a lot of people here who are looking for independent facilitators who are currently taking clients. Um, Disability Voices United does not endorse anybody, but we're happy to connect you. So if you are an independent facilitator and you're taking clients, please feel free to put your information in the chat. Or if you're looking for somebody, you can put that in the chat as well. And our last announcement before we get going is uh, from Tina. Um, I was, oops. My, my announcement is uh, our, our next I Get to Choose is on Friday, November 1st at noon. And at that meeting, we talked about self-determination for people that are just even just thinking about going in, not necessarily even started the process yet, um, and those who have only just begun. So we try to teach people how to, how to do that and connect them with the services that they need to do that. And we get to share stories of people who are in the program and how it's working for them. And um, and then the next piece flows perfectly into our presenters today is um, we have four presenters uh, that all accept self-determination program. And I'll start with, we have Janelle Scales and she is from Game Gen. You can give a wave, Janelle. <laughs> There you go. Um, we have Andrew Ainsworth from Exceptional Minds. Ah, there's Andrew. Hello. We have Janelle Arsich from Consult HR Services. Our second Janelle, we have two today. And we have Eric Kaufman from Upskill Specialist. And what we'll do is we'll have each of them tell you a bit about their company, and then we will have lots of time for Q&A so you can all ask questions. And how we do that is you can either put your question in the chat as we go along as you think about it, or um, you can raise your hand when we get to the Q&A and we will alternate between the two. So Janelle Scales from Game Jam, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. I'm Janelle from Game Gen, and we help turn video game players into video game developers through classes in design, coding, art, animation, and programming. Um, we have a full-time adult program where students participate 20 to 40 hours a week and they learn the skills to make video games. <clears throat> we accept um, self-determination. We have different tracks. Some um, people are um, heavily into design and they do more of a design and artsy track and some people like coding and the programming and they lead into their interest as well. Um, we're flexible with our scheduling um, you're assigned a mentor who sort of carries you through your journey at Game Gen, but you work with multiple people. Students collaborate all the time to improve their skills, their games, and just to socialize and um, have a good time together. We do field trips, sometimes to museums, so that um, when you're doing your designs, they are... Uh, accurate and um, to scale and you can understand texture so that translates to the art um, and the graphics that you create. Um, our students really love it. We have returned students. 
Our families really love it. I think that we're a warm and inviting place. And if you're looking, if you love video games and you want to um, learn how to make video games, we're the place for you to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Janelle. Um, and you guys are online, correct? Yes, it's a virtual school. So we can take students from all over with STP. And um, we have students throughout California. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have Janelle Arsich from Consult HR Services. Thanks, Christiana. Hello, everyone. I am going to just throw up my slides here. Give me one second. Okay. Come on, there we go. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so my name is Janelle Arsich, and I am an HR consultant with Consult HR Services. Um, and we are actually a part of United Cerebral Palsy of Sacramento. So, um, essentially, the CEO of UCP of Sacramento started Consult HR Services because of a lot of their clients that were looking for employment related services, employee services, recruiting, et cetera. Um, and the really cool part is that all of the profits that Consult HR Services makes goes back into all of the day programs for the UCP um, entities that we work with. So we are very familiar with nonprofits, with you know, working with disability services, DSPs, regional centers, et cetera. Um, and we really offer a wide variety of services that can help um, whether you are looking to hire somebody and actually be an employer. Um, we've done employee handbooks, we've done job descriptions, new hire documents. If anybody knows anything about employment in California, it is not easy. And um, there's a lot of compliance issues with it, even if you only have one or two employees. So we can certainly make sure that you get the, you know, get everything right. Um, and then we've also even done things like parent and caregiver manuals um, for those that are, you know, seeking out services, not quite sure where to start. Um, so we have worked with uh, programs with that as well. So just a little bit about what we do, what we're familiar with, what we can provide, as well as my contact information below. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janelle. You're welcome. Thank you. And we actually had a question in the chat that I'll, I'll ask you um, as we're going, because I th think it fits. Can you do this along with the financial management service? And also, can they get your slides? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess they can, right? Can you share the slides? On? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Eric um, already did it. He's ahead of us. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, we can work with FMSs. If that's if that, that was the question, right? Yes. 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 And I think that one of the 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 way that I met Janelle was that she was helping a self determination program client create mm -hmm. their employee handbook, and I thought, yes. wow, that is such a great idea to have somebody, and then also creating the job descriptions. So. When people go into self-determination program, a lot of us have never been employers before and and just really don't know how to do those things. So uh, we thought that Janelle was such a great resource to, to share with you all. Okay. You. So up next is, we have a very varied, I, I love when we have very varied people here. We have Eric Kaufman and he is with Upskill Specialists. Hi everyone, I'm just going to get my slides going. And there we go. So uh, my name is Eric. I am the co-founder at Upskill Specialist and an adult executive function coach and an educational therapist. So the big question that I get from most people is what are executive function skills, which is why I want to start quickly with this slide. Uh, there's no official definition or set number of executive function skills, but there are a few that are widely accepted. And so 
we like to go with this version, which is created by Peg Dawson and Richard Guare, which states that there's 12 executive functions. Essentially, our executive functions allow us to make decisions, be organized, regulate our emotions, and ideally, like live the life that we want to live. So you can see some, this is a lot of the type of skills that we work on with our clients, ranging from task initiation and managing procrastination to improving our ability to uh, sustain our attention, to manage stress, to set and achieve goals. Executive function coaching, the way that we do this is completely one-on-one. -on -one. So we take an individualized approach with every client and we meet with them on Zoom, which allows us to work with anybody throughout anybody in SDP, no matter where they are in California. The focus of our coaching is about developing skills to live a more independent life. So with every client that we're working with, the, no matter what skill we're working on, it's always towards the long-term goal of a higher level of independence. And the results that we're aiming for with our clients are skills for the adult world, higher level of independence, and what we see most commonly with our clients within the first month or two of working with them is just an increased sense of confidence. They're more independent. They're able to do more of those adult-related tasks that they want to be able to do. And because of that, their independence begins to grow. We, again, take an individualized approach. So every single session and every client, what we're doing with them looks quite different. But when I made a list of the most common skills that we work towards, this is what I came up with. So you can see it ranges from like laundry to time management, to using a calendar, to managing email, all the way down to finding and keeping a job, meal planning, grocery shopping, uh, systems to stay organized, like cleaning our room. Uh, using to-do lists is a big one as well. And then also creating and maintaining a budget. And uh, I was expecting a question of like, which FMS might you work with? And the answer is any. So like four examples, four, four FMSs that we're working with right now are FMS Pay, GTI, ACE, and Cambrian. But we're in a position where we're lucky enough to be able to uh, work with any FMS. Um, I think you can have my slides. So Eric, if you could put those in the chat or whoever's in charge, if you put those in the chat, that would be great. And if anybody uh, wants to learn more, you can send me an email. We have a specific part of our website specifically dedicated to SDP. And I also write a weekly newsletter that goes out on Sundays. That's all about just sharing like one actionable strategy to improve our executive function skills. So if you're interested, uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter there. Thank you so much. That was amazing, Eric. And um, when we met, we were talking about uh, my, my favorite conversation we had was you had somebody who had a goal and it made me laugh because I thought of my son. Uh, but do you want to share what his goal was? Sure. Yeah. So his, his 90 day goal is get my parents off my back. <laughs> uh, and I love it because that gets back to the point of independence and what we're working towards. And when we broke that goal down, what we decided to start with was managing his inbox, managing his email and being able to use his calendaring system more effectively. Um, so I just saw him today. He's he's actually, I'm really impressed with the progress he's making. It's great. Oh, that and that when you told me that, it made me laugh so hard and thought that is probably the best goal ever. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love it. It's a great one. I think his mom loved it too. She thought it was hilarious and like fully supported it. She's like, yes, this is what we want. <laughs> um, and are you can are you online and can you provide services anywhere in the state? Yes and yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. And and then we did have a question. Are you part of a team or is it just you? I'm part of the team. So I'm the co-founder along with Sean McCormick. Uh, we have a really small team. So there's only two other coaches on our team. And the plan is to, to keep it small. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Eric. Okay. So our last presenter for today last but not least is uh exceptional minds and where are you i see you right here ah oh, there you are hi andrew hi how are you doing hi uh, my name is andrew uh ainsworth i'm the director of academic programs here at exceptional minds um do we want to play that video link i sent to you all or do you want me to play it 
I can play it. No problem. Give me one. The first one, which is um, Exceptional Minds Decade of Impact. That would sort of tee everything up. Give me one second. It's loading. <laughs> Hold on. I have to share before it plays. <laughs> Okay, let me take up the screen. And let me know if you can hear it. Exceptional Minds is a vocational training program for young adults on the autism spectrum who want to have careers in animation and visual effects. The Exceptional Minds, we're very aware of the fact there are too many young adults with autism that are unemployed. There's nothing that they can't do, and they keep proving it time and time again. At this school, we ask. What is your goal? What is your dream? They give them confidence. They give them certification. They give them something tangible to use in their future. I've been able to grow so much, started seeing more clarity in my art style. It has been amazing just discovering what I'm good at. Learn more about visual effects, and now I do it full time. They know that they are making progress towards an achievable goal, not just a job, but a career path. The environment that we're given here is encouraging that creativity, the talent within us. This is where I was going to get the necessary skills to do what I wanted to do. They have so much that is untapped, and we need to explore to find out where their strengths are. They're feeling good about what they do and what they can do in the future. We go hand in hand with their focus and determination makes our movies far better. Some of our graduates have gone on to work in Nickelodeon, Marvel Studios, Cartoon Network, Mattel, Sony, and Fox. The studio is their first step into the professional world. Our Exceptional Mind Studio has worked on over 700 projects, employing dozens of graduates. We've formed amazing partnerships with all the major studios and streamers over the past 10 years. We are in love with acceptance inclusivity, hope, and a sense of community. It's a place where you can be comfortable. Life-changing. I feel so much less alone than I used to. It feels like I'm a member of society. These first two years for Exceptional Minds is something for us to celebrate. Exceptional Minds represents possibility and a reminder never to set limitations on someone. If you can connect people with their dreams, then the magic happens. One thing would be that Exceptional Minds is not only producing visual effects artists, animators, but hopefully directors, producers. We have an opportunity to give to every single student at this school who will actually be able to go out and participate in the dream. Exceptional Minds helped me. You come out with a bunch of friends and some new knowledge. It was some of the best three years of my life has really been a wondrous experience. It was the best risk that I ever took. So yeah, enjoy it. Enjoy the ride. Great. Love to congratulate Exceptional Minds on a decade of impact. Go out there and keep changing the world. The next generation after me is going to be in safe hands, and I look forward to seeing that future. Thank you. That's all we need to see, Christiana. Um, so Exceptional Minds is two things. It's an educational academy with a three-year VFX, video effects, and animation program, and it's also a studio. So what happens is that we have an actual animation studio and a VFX studio, which does work for outside clients like Marvel movies. We do all of their end credits, um, not many, many animation projects for many, many independent producers. So what we are is we're the training ground and also, in a sense, to use a, an analogy, the factory where we can actually build the cars. So we're, we're basically training people to work in the industry and then actually giving them a step up by allowing them to work here and then hopefully launching them into bigger careers outside of here or they end up uh, being here for a number of years and becoming full-time employees of our studios uh, we are both virtual and in person we're located in sherman oaks 
And we have many workshops, part-time offerings for students to dabble and to see if, you know, their skills and their, their uh, interests line up with what we do because we're fairly vigorous and who we accept because we want those people to work in the field. So uh, please uh, visit our website, exceptional-minds.org. Uh, and yeah, and I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Now, do you want to maybe explain? I think people don't always know what visual effects means. Do you want to well, explain sure. that? Visual effects in its simplest form is things that we're actually seeing here on Zoom, which is we see some people with different backgrounds. I see Christine Cantor, who's in a in in the in the grass right now. She's not actually in the grass. And Jamie Johnson is in space. He's not actually in space. What we're doing is we're actually doing some live compositing. We're doing two video layers, the live layer, which is layer, which is me, and then putting a background behind. So that's video effects in its simplest form. It's the weather person who goes in front of the, the green screen and they put the weather map behind them. Of course, it gets much more sophisticated in the movie world with set extensions. So we shoot a tiny hit a bit of the shot and then we extend the shot with um, with computer generated imagery. We put dinosaurs in, we take beards off of people, we um, make people look young, old, we do all sorts of things. We can take jewelry off. So all sorts of fixes, additions, all that kind of stuff. Well, I like the making people look young piece. <laughs> Can you do that on the fly for us? <laughs> no, but Zoom, Zoom is pretty good at making us look younger. So we should all be thankful that we we can meet on Zoom. I, I do like that piece. So um, let's get to questions. So if you um, have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. And there were lots of ones in the chat. So we're going to start with those. Um, so the first one was for Janelle. Um, would your services be something we could add to our SDP budget? Uh, oh, sorry, this is for Janelle Arsich. Um, are these services you can add to our SDP budget or are the resources free? Um, resources are not free. Um, I, I would assume you could add it to your budget depending on what level of service you're looking for. So it would be something we would you know, chat over what your needs are, customize that proposal, um, and then uh, send that over to you. So um, we do have a nonprofit discount, um, but yeah, so I, I would hope that you could certainly budget that in uh, to, to what you need um, for employment services. Thank you. So I do wanna clarify because in self-determination program, there's a big difference between a budget and a spending plan. So I wanna make sure that they understand this is not something that the regional center would increase your budget to pay for. However, it is something you could absolutely pay for in your spending plan as long as you have a goal for it. So if this is something that you think that you might need, make sure that you have a goal um, in your person center plan saying, you know, I'm going to need some assistance with my HR and to create my uh, you know, the, whatever service that you think that you would need. And for any of the, the providers today, you it would need to be a goal in your individual program plan. And then depending on which service it is, is whether the regional center would increase your budget or not for it. So, um, but great question, Catherine. Our next question is from Carmen Silva at 447. Could you please put more information in the chat, please? So um, we will make sure to put everybody's info all kind of together in the chat at once so you guys can copy it down. I think that, that we were putting it in as each person was speaking, but we can put it all together for you at once so the community can grab it. So yes, uh, we will do that for you. For Cecilia Ortiz at 449, she was asking Eric, Good afternoon. At what age can you apply for this service and what code is your service? So we work with adults, which would essentially be anybody 18 years or older. The code that independent facilitators are using is 331, I believe. 
someone might need to double check me on that one, but I'm pretty sure it's 331. And, and what I'll tell you is there's not one consistent code for everybody for everything. So it would really be depend what their goal was uh, for what they were using it for. So if you were learning executive function skills for work, it could possibly be under the employment goals, uh, service codes. It could be as just a straight service. It could be so. So there isn't one service code necessarily. It's really how the, the um, goal was written for what they're going to be using the service for. Since yours is kind of a, you can have um, executive functioning support in so many areas of your life, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I would say there isn't necessarily one specific goal. Um, so for Exceptional Minds, we have a question from Miriam at 455. What's the percentage of graduates who gain long-term employment in this industry? Well, that's a good question, and I'm not going to lie, um, or, or I'm not going to speak untruths. Um, it's a gig. It's a gig economy, so full-time employment is fairly rare amongst graduates. We have a printed and published employment rate of eighty-six percent, but I would suggest I've only been here six months. I'm going to suggest that that is not in the field. That is just employed. I'm also going to say that I think that the important thing here is going forward with the state of the industry in Los Angeles and around the world, the production, film production, um, there will be an, ex there should be an expansion into other industries, creative industries like advertising, industries that do other things, but do creative things within, within them. For example, medical instruments, doing 3D models. We are branching out into that. So I'm basically giving you a politician's answer of, um, I'm not going to give you a huge number. I'm just going to say that there is, what we are graduating are people that are able to work and do creative entry-level work, whether it be in animation, which is the hardest thing to work in right now, or whether it be in an office, um, an architect's office or a dentist's office doing graphic design, which would be a much easier role to find. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm not going to give you a percentage because I just don't know that right now. And I don't think it's fair to give out um, expectations with high numbers. Um, Maybe not a good answer. <laughs> no, it was a good answer. And um, I think that so my husband actually does visual effects and it is uh, such a changing field right now. There's yes. so many, so much is in motion. So I, I thought that was actually a very good answer. <laughs> um, for Eric, Virginia H at 458 asked, how does this differ from ABA services? Ooh, interesting question. That's a really good question. So we are not behaviorists. And while we work closely with like our client's team, which quite often we have clients who are receiving ABA services and our goals may align with the goals uh, that an ABA clinician is using, we're really focused on just really developing executive function skills. Um, so yes, it's some, a lot of these are behaviors, quote unquote, but we're really focused on like, how can we help somebody improve their awareness and time management? How can we help somebody improve their emotional regulation? How can we help somebody develop a calendaring, calendaring system that allows them to understand what their day is going to look like and actually check and use that calendar on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure. Um, we have another one for Andrew, um, also from Miriam at 457. Are you vendored with regional centers and under what service codes are you working on the spending plan? We are vendored. Now I am new at this job and I'm from Canada. I know, crazy, but I am from Canada. So I don't know all that stuff. So that is handled by our registrar, our registrar, Cassandra. And if you, I guess you'll be sharing emails with everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you email me, I will set you up with Cassandra who can answer and who's our expert in that area. 
of self-determination and all that. So sorry, I don't have that information. Um, and a follow-up for you is Kim Foster at 501 said, what ages does Exceptional Minds and the EF, EF online program serve? So our full-time program serves high school graduates, 18 plus essentially adults, uh, college age. And then our part-time programming, our workshops in summer, and also during the school year from 4 to 6 p.m. And on Saturdays, services 14 years and up. Um, we have another question for Eric from Maria at 450. Do you provide your service in person? Right now, we don't. All of the work that we're doing is on Zoom. Um, oh, and Melissa Jones at 502 asked what your hourly rate is. So our you'll be able to find all of our prices on our website. The way that we start with a client is we ask for a commitment to uh, 90 days, which typically is one session per week, which turns out to be 13 sessions. The total cost of the 90 day package is $2,754. Um, and Andrew, we had another question for you, which is Inland Regional Center oh, from Jeanette at 501. Inland Regional Center needs more people in groups like Mr. Ainsworth. Is there a vendor like it in Riverside? That's a question for me. Um, it was it was under you, but I'm not certain that's a question for you. Um, I am not aware of another program like Exceptional Minds in um, the Riverside area. Um, if anybody knows of one, you can put it in the chat or let us know, but I don't know of any um, off of the top of my head. Yeah, we're fairly unique, but you can study online with us. We do have full-time students online, virtual, in other parts of California. Um, and Roger H. at 502 asked, um, how many students do you accept per year? This year, first year, we have 10 students in person and four students online. And is that the max you'll take or? Yeah, we have restraints based on our the size of our campus classroom. So, yeah. Ah, okay. For now it is. And if I remember correctly, you do um, like summer programs as well, don't yeah, you? Yeah, summer workshops. So the summer workshops are all day. We have four sessions. So if you go to our website, you can see there's a workshop tab and you can see all the information on workshops. And is that for also people who have graduated or can it be um, like- It can be for anybody 14 plus, or we also have alumni who come in and do workshops with uh, technology and, and software, which is new. Um, oh. or new stuff that's being used. Oh, um, and Melissa in at 509 in the chat said that she actually has Riverside clients that commute daily or found an apartment near the school to to attend yeah. Exceptional Minds. So we have, we have people from out of state who move here. We have two people from Florida. It's pretty incredible, actually. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, Eric, we have another question for you um, from Jeanette at 506. What methodology do you use and can you give an example? Sure. I, it's a tough question to answer because we use a lot of different methodologies depending on the executive function scale that we're working on. I would say the most common one that comes up is gradual release of instruction. So this might look like if we're going to use an example of um, creating a, a to-do list, we'll say. This might look like, first, I would model what it looks like to create this style of to-do list using motivational interviewing to ensure that the client, whoever I'm working with, understands what I'm saying and, and seems to feel like this is something that they'd be willing to try. The next step would be us working on a to-do list for the client together. And the final step of gradual re release would be the client creating the to-do list on their own. 
I would say we use gradual release of instruction throughout every session, especially when we're working on a new skill. And I, I remember when we were talking about it, you, you had a lot of, um, like things in your bag of like, oh, the, I know somebody somewhat like you, do you want to try this method or let's try a different method. So you have lots of different, like there is no one set you were going to tailor and figure it out for that person. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's really about working with the client to help them create a system or a strategy or a tool that they're actually going to use and actually helps them. So like what works for me probably won't work for a lot of other people because we're all uniquely wired. We all have different brains. So it's really about collaborating with the client. Which is so self-determination program. Like that's it, it exactly is. where I'm at, <laughs> that, that it isn't, uh, why it would be a tough to be a vendored service, like a traditional, because they say, here's your, your program plan and you have to do it this way. So I think one of the things I really liked when we were talking is your ability to really customize it, uh, and, and kind of tease out what works for that person. Um, I yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a journey along with the person that we're working with. Um, Cecilia Ortiz asked about the payment for sessions in advance and how many sessions do you say for 90 days? Thanks for asking that question. So over the course of 90 days, we typically meet once per week, which turns into 13 sessions. Um, we do not ask for all of the payment for the 90 days up front. We do our billing every other Monday. Um, so assuming we assuming there were two sessions, uh, or sorry, four sessions per month, you'd be billed twice per month, and that would be 740. Uh, during each billing cycle, assuming me we met for those number of sessions. Um, oh, this one is back to um, Andrew. Um, Catherine from at 509 asked, what percentage of your students are coming from far away for in-person and where do they stay? Um... I don't know what percentage come from far away, probably about 20%, 20-30%. And then we hook them up with, there's a group called Homies, I think. Again, Cassandra, our registrar, um, has details about this. And they often have roommates through Homies, or they have roommates through uh, fellow students they meet on campus. Oh, wonderful. And in the summer, will they come and stay as well? Um, yeah, actually, we've had somebody from New York State here all summer oh, wow. um, taking workshops, um, coming every day, actually, five days a week. And then um, Jane Sheen at 510 asked, how often do your students meet? Is it an everyday thing to attend? Yes, it is. So as we know, as some people know, nor colleges and universities often have schedules which are you know students will have one and a half days off they only have about 15 to 20 hours of class we're more intensive than that we have class every day from 10 until 3 30 and then we have four to six we have workshops and tech labs and drawing labs so students can be here um they're, they are here five days a week from 10 to 3.30 at least. And then some of them go to tech lab from four to six on Tuesday and Thursday. And we've got a drawing lab right now for the first years happening at this moment. So they've been in class all day and now they're doing drawing lab. So we keep everybody pretty busy <clears throat> and engaged. Um, uh, for Janelle, we... Uh... Arsich, we had a question from Kim Foster at 511. Um, does your program focus on working with financial management services? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I think we're really focused on working with the client who has become an employer and what are the compliance regulations behind that? How do you set those expectations for your employees in terms of policies, job descriptions, et cetera? 
Um, so that's really our focus. I don't know, Christiana, you can expand on that a little bit more with the FMS. So the the financial management service is the person responsible for paying them, whether you're a co-employer or a sole employer, it, it wouldn't matter. They they're doing the payroll, but the participants are really responsible for doing the scheduling and the hiring and um, all of the things that Janelle's talking about that, again, if, if you're new to the program, you may, I had never hired somebody before my son went in. And, and so I think that it it's great to have somebody who could help you. And especially when it does come to the rules about scheduling people. So, you know, you know, the overtime rules and and when they should have breaks and all of those kind of things. Um, so that sounds, am I correct? And, and those are the things that you can help the participants with. Right, right. So as you're learning to be a good employer, I think right. <laughs> these are the skills. So it's, it's you know, really um, helping and training, you know, the as we're learning to to be employers. Um, so we have another question. Uh, From Helen, and this is for Eric, and it's um, is at 512, is this one hour per session per week for 90 days, or how, how long is the session? Sessions are 45 minutes. For, for some clients, if 45 minutes is too long, we will take like intentional breaks during the session. Um, or we do have some clients who choose to meet for a little bit less than 45 minutes, which is totally fine. Um, and for Game Gen from Kim Merzouk at 514, she asked, um, can Game Gen please provide information about the duration of your sessions and your programs and what your classes are composed of? Hi, I can do a little bit of that. I do community outreach and marketing, but um, like I said, our program is full time. So students work sort of self-paced between 20 and 40 hours a week. And sometimes that's several hours a day to get the 40 hours a week. Um, <clears throat> the classes are different and what start, all of our students start off making classic games and building the foundation from making classic video games to more complex games. So they um, start off with games like Asteroids, Mario, things that are 2D <clears throat> and the coding is rather simplistic. And then they evolve into games and designs that they like themselves and they tell their own stories. Um, the program is self-paced so it can range from anywhere from 18 months to three years something like that depending on how students move through the program um, and what their support needs are and um, you know if they take breaks and things like that if you're really focused and motivated you can definitely fly through but we have plenty of students who stay longer um, <clears throat> and each class is different so those i don't have I think Jamie is still on here and he might be able to say more about the individual classes, but that's the overall um, breakdown of the hours. So, you know, between four to eight hours a day. Perfect. Uh, Jamie, did you want to add to that? Oops. Are you... Hold on one second. We'll get you unmuted. There you go. Hi. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so yeah, pretty much uh, what Janelle said. Um, we definitely try to focus on uh, trying, to, trying to push our students into what it, they would might experience at a studio level in terms of, you know, they have their independent projects, but they also can work on teams uh, to make bigger and more complex games. And yeah, it just really depends on the individual. Like, you know, we'll, we'll have some people come in and they're already just incredible artists. And so they just want to learn, well, how can I take my characters that I love drawing and, and animate them? And so they can get through it incredibly quick because they're already dedicated. They already have really strong work ethic, uh, you know, but then, then we'll have some people that they don't really know what they want to do. They just know they love video games and they want to be involved somehow. And so, for, you know, for them, they might need to stick around for a little bit longer until they 
kind of first establish what they really want to do and then they kind of lock into that and, and develop those skills yeah um so do they need um a certain uh computer or, or level of a computer to be to to be able to do this we we usually say just try not to try not to go with like a chromebook um you know that would be like the probably just just below what would be except you could technically make it work for a little bit but eventually they would get to to programs that the chromebook just can't handle mm -hmm. um you know and so it really just uh it yeah it kind of depends on what they want to do because if they want to do art and animation you know they don't have to have like a, a crazy gaming computer necessarily but if they want to get into the game design where they're working directly in the game engine itself and they're building elaborate levels and whatnot then they're going to want something a, a little stronger in that Oftentimes, we'll go hand in hand. Where if you if you have a new computer that can play a modern game, then it typically can also work with some of the programs that we use. Wonderful. So you say when it's self paced, does it mean somebody's working with them all day, or do they kind of give them an assignment and then they work for a bit, or, or how does that kind of work? Yeah, that's. I I mean, it's um, yeah. So they have an assignment. They they kind of have a path that they they go on, and our mentors are always there in case they need help. So, um, you know, all of our students are assigned a primary mentor and, but they're all part of a, 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 a bigger group. So even if their primary mentor is with another student, they have another mentor available, you know, so there's always, uh, you know, that chance to get help. And uh, we're constantly pushing for independence, but um, obviously we want to be there for them as much as they need us. So it's kind of like, you know, do your best, but we're here if you need help, absolutely reach out. You know, we, we meet at, at scheduled times if that works for them. Um, and we kind of work together on the project and, and answer questions, exchange ideas, and that kind of thing. And then, of course, like we said, there's the the group projects that are are, are more um, intensive um, that we really try to you know helps them socialize and and understand what it really means to be a part of a team. And how do they? How do you pick the groups? Do they pick them, or do you kind of match people together? That you think will it's, work well or it's kind of matching them together i mean they're they're able to switch at any time but in the beginning it's like oh so you love art sweet we have a, a mentor that is an amazing artist can help you take you as as far as you need to go or if you love programming awesome we have a mentor that um you know has uh some time available for another student can take on another student and they are and you know incredible programmer so we, we try to pair them up that way and if they ever change their mind and go you know what I'm kind of tired of programming. Can I just switch to art? That's totally fine. Well, we can move them to a different group. No big deal. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, so Kim Foster at 519 asked, um, what age group do you serve? And is the program in person or virtual? You want to go for that one, Janelle? Yeah. We have a kids and teens program that's less intense. It's a few hours a week. And um, that's around the age of eight and up, eight to eight eight to 17 through 17. And then our adult program is 18 and up. And what was the last, second part of the question? Um, oh, is it in person or virtual? <clears throat> our, right now, all of our um, classes are virtual. Yeah, we do have in-person meetups from time to time, but since we service so many students, um, not all the students can make it to the in-person meetups, but they are in different locations. But all of our classes and coursework is is virtual. Um, so I have another question for Eric from Ali M at five fourteen. Um, is this only for adults? Are you the only coach? Oh, it's about five questions in one. Is this an okay. in-person or via Zoom? Um, are you be are you Billing monthly, like a subscription or per session, and what is the service code? <laughs> okay, you might need to remind me of a couple of those. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna sure. do my best. Uh, yes, this is only for adults. So we work with anyone ages 18 and up. All of our sessions are done on Zoom. Um, I am not the only coach, although I am one of the coaches. We have two other coaches on our team. There was a billing question. Could you repeat that one? Um, do you bill monthly like a subscription or per session? We bill every other Monday. Okay. And was did I answer all of them? Um, oh, and then service code, which I think we already answered. Yes. Oh, and then we have one that said, 
Uh, Levi Smith at 514 asked if you could do more than a 90 day package. Absolutely. So actually 100% of our SDP clients have continued past 90 days. Um, we ask for a 90 day commitment because it does take time to develop executive function skills, especially because so much of this is related to habits and routines and it just simply takes time to make some progress. Um, but when we approach that 13th session at the end of the 90 days, we do a bit of a reflection and, and talk about the growth that we've seen and really speak with our client to decide, should we continue working together? And if so, what, what are gonna be the new goals? Like what's our reason, what's our purpose for continuing? Um, I hope that answers the question. You, you got them all. You, you have a better memory than I do. <laughs> See, you've got better <laughs> executive functioning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Game Jen, uh, Jeanette at 524 asked, are these services just for highly functioning participants? Are there accommodations for participants with more challenges? Example, nonverbal, et cetera. Um, you know, high functioning is a really diverse word. <laughs> and so that means different things for different people. Um, we do have like an academic specialist right now who um <clears throat> specializes with working with people with disabilities and has um a higher education in special um like special education and they also have um, disabilities themselves so that person is really the best person to talk to his name is sage and he is the one who helps us <clears throat> with accommodations for different students and assessing whether students make a good fit for the program or um, don't. We have an assessment um, at the end of each tour it's offered. So what we encourage people to do if they're interested in the program is to book an online tour so they can get a virtual tour of the school, of the program, of the classes. And then they take an assessment, which is sort of like model building a game and from that assessment, we can see if our program can meet some of the ways, some of their um, accommodations and their needs. We work on a program called Discord. If you're a gamer, you probably have Discord, you're on it, and you're probably talking lots of smack to other competitors. But um, <laughs> we, we use it for educational purposes as well as smack talking. And um, <clears throat> So we, we, our students type, some of them are less verbal, but, um, you know, we do video, we do typing, uh, we really try to make the program fit for, you know, the students needs. Wonderful. Um, so Janelle, um, is it true that, oh, this is Janelle Arsich, is it true that paid PTO, paid time off, is not mandatory in California, just five sick days. Yes, that is correct. No PTO, no vacation, not required, holiday pay, not required. Um, only thing that is mandatory is 40 hours or five days of sick leave, whichever is greater for the employee. So we're going to, they're, they're going to grill you now on this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, RD at 527 asked, Eric, do you take clients who are not in the SDP program? Yes, we do. So about 50% of our clients are in SDP and the other 50%, we call them our private pay clients. Um, and then for game Jen, Kim Foster asked at 526, um, what's the duration of your program? Um, each student kind of determines how long they're going to be in the program. So it's pretty much a minimum of a year in 18 or 18 months to a maximum of four years. Um, we do service lots of different clients with diverse needs. And so that means the timetable is different for each student. So, um, it really just depends on how you move through the curriculum. I like that you said that it's self-paced so people can, you know, work at their own own rate. <laughs> um, Jan Opsvig at 5.11 made the comment, 
I have a client that's figuring out how to commute to um, Exceptional Minds from Rancho Cucamonga because the program has been so beneficial. So it sounds like you get people who come, who are, are willing to commute to, to get to you. Yeah, I also, um, I suggest to people that, you know, they could do their first year online and then maybe in their second year they could move closer. So if they're, say, three hours away and they can't commute, there is that option to come for the second and third year to be part of the in-person community. Because I think the the in-person uh, activities that we do, game nights, um, movie nights, drawing, tech lab, all of those things are just really important. Lunch hour. We do things like uh, meditation in the morning. We go on walks uh, at lunch. So it's uh, it's a nice atmosphere here. It seems like you have more, it's, it's not just education, it's a community. You're building a community. Well, I think that if you look at uh, post-secondary education, student development is a big side of, of, of a student's growth. Mm -hmm. And the academic side is really, for some, it would ar some could argue that it's really 25% of the meaningful time at college. I would argue that it's the student growth portion of it outside of academics is almost more important than the academic part. That's just my bias. Because I think we're all, we're all, all of our students are smart, intelligent. Um, they're just growing and um, experiencing. And so it's about framing that experience with a, you know, a little bit of technology and a little bit of uh, animation and this and that, but really it's just about growth and uh, socializing and friends and being in the world. Well, and having a group of people you have a common interest yeah. is, is really, you know, a great, Great thing. RD at 524 said, sounds like some students might use executive function, executive skills coaching that Eric offers to proceed through the other programs. And that's that's very true. <laughs> I could see some some partnerships going on here that uh, that would be very beneficial to help them. Absolutely. I was thinking the same thing, actually. I would like I would like Eric to move into exceptional minds. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like an awesome place. <laughs> uh, Melissa, go ahead and unmute. I just had a quick question about overtime. Um, I used to work in a completely different industry, and the company that I worked for was based in Maryland. And I know they really struggled to keep up with what the latest rules were with every state. But we were told in the industry that I was in, even if I worked two hours a day, the seventh day was overtime. So they really encouraged us not to work seven days a week because they didn't want to pay that overtime. Is there anything in this arena that would affect overtime for somebody that works seven days a week? So overtime is very state specific. Um, so California is gonna be very different than any other state essentially, and all states are very unique in their overtime rules. Um, but yes, for specifically for California, the seventh day, doesn't matter how many hours you have worked, if you have worked over 40 hours in that work week, by the time you hit that seventh day, it will be overtime. Um, and in some cases, if you work more than eight hours on that seventh day, it will all be double time as well. So the overtime rules are very specific. They're also industry specific. Um, so if you work in an office versus in you know agriculture versus construction versus home health services, they're actually very specific to that as well. Um, so we can certainly talk more offline if you want to shoot me an email, if you've got more of a specific question. But um, yes, for the for the most part, generally speaking, overtime on the seventh day, um, or excuse me, working on the seventh day is all going to be overtime. And and um, I think those are a lot of the questions we're struggling with because the financial management services kind of have some different rules. Um, and I'm going to get the term wrong because I've lost it um, of how they're not categorized, what the 
classified or but classified thank you i i knew that there was in there <laughs> that was a good guess <laughs> there you, go. you got it um and so some of them say they're classified different uh, with one FMS than in a different one. So they have slightly different rules. And oh. that is something we are running into. So we don't have, so it's hard to give uniform answers. We kind of have to ask, you know, how they're classified um, and right, each right. of them. And, and then we also have that um, if they're in co-employer model, the financial management service is the employer of record. Mm -hmm. So they have, you know, they're the employer right. and they are usually large employers. And then if you're a sole employer, the participant or their loved one is the employer record, which they may not have more than three or four employees. And so- right. we can... And that can change things depending on your size. There's just so much in, in HR, I hate to say it, but it, it's always like, it depends, right? So it depends on where you're located, how big you are, you know, your industry, et cetera. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of nitty gritty in there. There is so much nitty gritty to, and so, so hard to keep track of it all. Oh yeah. my God. But I will say for participants, um, you- as an individual, will only have to really understand your regional center's rules and your one financial management service rules. So, so it you you can learn those rules and it won't be overwhelming. It's hard for the people who work in it, like independent facilitators, where we have to know all the FMS rules and all of the different regional centers. But when you are a participant, you will learn it and figure it out, and it will become second second nature to you. So don't feel like you'll have to you know know all these random variables, you know, working with somebody like Janelle or your financial management service. So you learn just how you schedule your people. Well, it, it, it's doable. Don't, don't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> right. Cause it's very overwhelming at first. So, um, and I'm so sorry, I do have to hop off. I've got to take my son to soccer before the sun sets. <laughs> um, I did see one more question though, just in the chat, somebody had a question again about sick leave. So I just wanted to clarify that really quickly for Miriam. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a 90 day waiting period for sick leave. So if you have an employee that's only working, I don't know, one day a week, maybe, or, you know, eight or 10 hours a week, they still have to fulfill that 90 days of employment. And those can be very scattered um, before they're eligible for sick leave. So you might take a couple of years until you're eligible for sick leave if you have an employee that is only working maybe, you know, one or two days a week. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, oh, well, thank you very much, because I think one of our concerns was if they give it all up front, what prevents them from taking their entire sick leave and then quitting? Right. I mean, unfortunately, nothing, but at least you do have that 90 day waiting period. So yeah. um, depending on if you want to accrue it or front load it. But yes, you still have that 90 day period, which is nice. Wonder well, Janelle, thank you so much for coming. All right. You're and all welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Rushi, go ahead. Oops, you unmuted for a second and then it muted it again. Hi, uh, I have a comment about the um, sick leaves. It really depends on FMS uh, because our FMS uh, allows um, at any point of time to take the hours. So uh, it really depends on the FMS you're working with. It, it, and that's something we've been talking a lot about of... Uh, <laughs> because um, they can choose whether they give it all up front or whether they accrue it. And and so, mm -hmm. and and we can't, as participants, we don't really get a choice in that of right. to make that choice, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Rushi. Um, Cecilia Ortiz at 531 asked Game Gen, um, Janelle, sorry, I didn't hear when you explained your program. Could you please repeat? Um, oh, there you are. Hi, hi. <clears throat> so sort of the little schmeal about what Game Gen does. Mm -hmm. um, game Gen is a program that turns video game players into video game developers through classes in coding, art, animation, design, um, and programming. We have an adult program that has 20 to 40 hours a week, and it's virtual. We have a kids and teens program that is just a few hours a week to learn those foundational skills of of game development. Um, our program for adults is about 18 months to 
four years, depending on the student's needs and pace. If you're interested in our program, I suggest you go to our website, gamegen.com, and you can book a tour and you get a virtual tour with a live person of what's happening, some of the coursework, and you take an assessment, which is essentially building a small game. You don't have to have any game development skills to, to work with us at Game Gen. You just have to have a passion for um, game development and video games. You need your own computer, but sometimes if you, you know, are work with the Department of Rehabilitation or something like that, you can get funding for a computer. Um, it just can't be a Chromebook. Um, I think that's like the very quickest meal that I can give, but you can take an assessment at the end of the tour and that will show you if you're a good fit for our program, if you kind of just like how that work is and if we can meet your needs and accommodations. Wonderful. Um, do any of your, have any of your um, clients um, created games that they've sold? We haven't um, had anybody publish our students' games yet, but we do have some of our students, like one of our former students is working for GenVid and has worked on Marvel games and things like that. And he recently was on a team that won an Emmy for some of the work that he's done in design. Um, but their games are playable and um, you can play some of their games online. We have a big um, collection of the games that the students make. Some of our students do other work too. They don't just make video games. One of our students is working um, at a museum and the museum is doing um, a virtual ex exhibition and he is helping them design some of the exhibit um, through some of the work that he's doing with game gens and our mentors help him in that work as well. So it is, um, you can apply the skills to lots of different um, work. Oh yeah, one of our students is working for a toy company. There's just, um, you can do a lot of different things. You don't have to design games, <laughs> but um, that's sort of what we specialize in. And then those skills can be applicable to other things. Wonderful. Um, so my son is really into, and I'm probably gonna get it wrong. Uh, he's, cause he's building a game and he wants to put on itch.io. I don't know what that uh -huh. means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what it's does just that like mean? a platform <laughs> it's almost like um just like a almost like a blogger site where you can like play games and so. and people just share their games so they can yeah they share oh. their games mm -hmm. oh. so listen to me being all technical <laughs> um maria k at 533 asked exceptional minds where are you located oh andrew you're muted We are located in Sherman Oaks on Ventura Avenue. So around where the 405 dips down into the valley. Oh, and, and Jamie Johnson said, uh, that's where all our students publish and share their games from the start, itch.io. So yay, Jamie. <laughs> knew what I was talking about. At least I, I, I pretended to sound like I knew what I was talking about. Well, my goodness, we have answered all the questions, which is so unusual. Um, the crowd is very quiet tonight. Um, do you have, does anybody have any other questions about self-determination that they want to ask? You can raise your hand and put it in the chat or any other questions for our providers today. Well, you guys are quiet. Okay. Well, I guess everybody has, everything's working in their self-determination program. Yay. All the problems have been resolved <laughs> and uh, we can go on with life. So, okay. Well, I just want to thank everyone so much for coming and, oh, Carrie, go ahead and unmute. Sorry. Um, I had a question about gym memberships in getting paid in SDP. You nod your head like you've heard this before. 
yeah, just really struggling with how the format doesn't work with the gym um, membership places because they I want a that. credit card on on file. Yes, that's it's it has been a struggle. Um, and I'll say that um, the financial management services are changing rules, uh, how they do things. And, and so um, I'm going to give you a tough answer, which is so like my son did a lot of things with social rec. And we ended up having to change financial management services because we were struggling with the ability to pay for those things. So different financial management services are better at paying for different things. And so I will say that some of them will do have credit cards that they can put on file. They have credit cards that have a set amount. They have time limits. It, not all of them do this. So it is one of those things that at, at one point, we just, my son's um, in his fourth year, he's just going into his fourth year. So we decided to make a move because we were struggling kind of with those things. Um, so I know, <laughs> and I, I, I don't take it lightly because it, I know it can be a, a difficult thing to change FMSs. So, um, but it is something to think about if you are really struggling. Now, I will also point out there's a directive that requires the financial management services to pay for local businesses in the method that they um, typically bill. Uh, and But not all of them are, are following a, a, that definition to a T. So I will say we're up to, I think, 22 financial management services now. So we are getting to a point where we have a lot more choice, which I think is a good thing. So it, it might be a thing. Now, the other thing that I have heard a few people is that they have been able to get um, a couple uh, different specific um, workout places that will do like a three month payment. And then they can do it through a 331, do a, a one-time purchase. And so a few have been able to do that. Uh, you can unmute yourself again, Carrie. Oh, there it goes. Um, yeah, <clears throat> they, because I think we were told that we could only have one month at a time on each invoice that goes to Mainzel. Um, so we'd have to do a purchase order once a month. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, um, oh, I'm sorry. The, my follow-up question was, can you, um, can you direct me to where to find that, um, the policy or whatever you call it for that you mentioned about them having to, they have to like work with the program. Yes. Give me one second. I'm looking it up here. It's Thank on, you so much. It's on the self-determination program page and uh, for directives, which I'm going to put that just general link. So anybody who is interested knows where to find the directives. So I'll, I'll put that one first. So if you want to find any of the self-determination program directives, that is located on this page. And the one specifically around that one is... Uh, you know what? I thought I could grab it super quick, but I'm, it's not jumping out at me. Um, I will uh, send you a private message with my email and you can email me and I will send it to you. Um, Rushi, go ahead. Hi, uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, I was able to get uh, the gym um, membership paid for the whole year and you have to talk to the manager and like let them know to send the invoice like you want them to 
Uh, so sometimes that also helps to get it paid for the whole year, send one invoice for the whole year, but they have to be cooperative with you. So another way to... <laughs> Thank you. That's so helpful. And and so, yes, I have heard people who were able to do it as a one year, as a one time payment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, you, you have to get the provider to be willing to do an invoice right. for you to, to get it. So, yeah. Um, Melissa, go ahead. Do you have something to add? To, I'm, I'm bet you have something to add for that. <laughs> Yes, I'm an independent facilitator, and I often tell my parents, it's one thing to get regional center to approve it, but it's the next thing to have the find an FMS that will pay for it. So it's really, really, really important that you kind of have an idea of what social rec activities you want to do, and when you're when you're talking to the different FMSs, find out if they have a way to pay for that. Um, because it's it's definitely a barrier. Um, the downside of paying it for a whole year is what if your child decides they don't want to go to LA Fitness anymore and you've just paid for a whole year? You're not going to get anybody to refund that money to you because you paid for it. So um, just remember that when you are you know, investing in a year's membership. And um, I would also recommend a lot of the gyms will let them go for, you know, they have like a 30 day trial before. So maybe before you do the year, have them try it, see if they like it. I, I do laugh because I think I, probably every person in this room has had a gym membership they didn't use. We're all kind of guilty of that. So yeah, it is a, a making sure it is something that they're gonna wanna do is important. Uh, Melissa, did you have another question or were you adding to the, the gym? No, that's it. Thank you. Um, I actually found the right directive. So I'm going to put that in the chat for you, Carrie. Um, for, um, uh, so. Does anybody else have any other questions or shall we wrap it up for the day? Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming. Our next Connect, we will have a new financial management service in town and they're gonna come and present um, so you can meet them. And thank you all so much to our presenters, to Game Jen, to Eric, to Andrew, for, and to um, uh, uh, both Janelle's um we appreciate you so much for coming and we will uh, get all of your information out to everybody so have a wonderful evening everyone thank you